father, I think, who was responsible for turning him around. Really? Mm -hmm. So he influenced his Oh, his yes, position. definitely. My, my husband was, he had a certain naivete about him. You know, he'd mm. always, from, from age three on, wanted to be not, not, not only in the Navy, but he wanted to be the chief admiral of the mm. German Imperial Navy. Hmm. And that wish was, you know, destroyed in 1918 when the First World War was lost. Now, did he meet, uh, he spoke out, he began speaking out against Hitler yes, in 1933. Right and did yeah. he meet Hitler? How yes. many times did he meet Hitler? Mm -hmm. under what Only once, and that was, uh, was a terrible meeting because um, uh, he was summoned to the Reich Chancellery and once arrived there, oh, that was already after he had founded this new branch of the church, of the Protestant church, called the Confessing Church, because Hitler had installed the German Christians into a branch of, Protest, of the Protestant church um, who were for Hitler, and Hitler eventually was to become the Messiah. But, um, you know, he still needed the church until then, and my husband was summoned into Hitler's presence in the Vice Chancellery, and um, for the first 15 minutes, Hitler went into one fit. He had these screaming fits, mm. those monologues, you know. And when he went through, uh, he just warned that uh, people better behave or else. And hiding behind him was the new, brand new bishop of the new Christ German Christian branch of the church. Mm. Uh, Ludwig Müller, and his name was Ludwig the Desperate. He was mm. the Verzweifelte. He had picked that man because he was the only Protestant bishop he knew. Yeah. And on the way out, he, Hitler went from one to the other and shook hands. And when it came to my husband, my husband held his hand and said, you said to me that I should leave the fate of the German people to you but the germ fate of the German people, to care for the fate of the German people. That care was given to me by God, and he could, only God can take it from me. Now Hitler had no more time to have another fit, but he was just shook, you know, um, uh, took his hand away abruptly, and that was the uh, end of the interview. That, yes, of course. That that now, subsequently his, his, his fate was sealed. His after fate that. was sealed, and, yes. he, and he lost right away. He lost his position as a pastor, and was forbidden to preach and all that. And my husband just didn't pay. My husband was a pastor. He was not, not your husband pay, yet. No, <laughs> he did not pay any attention mm -hmm. to it. Of course, and later on, I, you know, we all I had that came up with that idea. Worse than having a, a, a pastor of that caliber before him uh, was the fact that he, the lowly axe corporal, mm. had been put down and not yelled at but spoken to by a highly uh, a high-ranking naval officer, and that he would couldn't. In the presence of other people, Göring was, was there. He was humiliated. Was there? Yeah. He was, and Hitler yeah. suffered from a terrible inferiority sure. complex. Sure, sure. Was things so? And then subsequently, your husband was yes. in prison. Yes, he was. He was. The the, yeah, he, they came on the first of of July. They came uh, and picked him up, and he too. And that must be, be connected because. Uh, to something my husband did uh, two weeks before he had written a letter which I have at home by the way to the Minister of Justice complaining about the situation ending with the words Herr Minister I'm telling you all this so later people cannot accuse me of having been silent. Isn't ah, that interesting? That is yeah. interesting. And then he was taken and after he had his trial after which he was, um, uh, he was set free. Hmm. A sign that even at that late date, February 1938, several months before the Kristallnacht, that there were still judges in Germany who based their verdicts on the law and on the law alone. 
that Hitler couldn't forgive, but he couldn't do anything about it. But being the Reichskanzler, you know, he could have him have him kidnapped, and he, so was, he was kidnapped, kidnapped by the, on his way home. His family, his friends, never saw him again. And, and he was then eight years in concentration. Then he was camps. one. He had been in mm -hmm. prison for for a year, mm -hmm. and seven years, three years in Sachsenhausen, and four years in Dachau, and was by a miracle liberated by the Americans at the end of the he war. He was uh, three, four years in Dachau, and I, I, I read in solitary yeah. confinement. He was in solitary How all the time. did he serve? I mean, you have spoke, you had spoken to him that, subsequently about this. How did he survive physically, emotionally, uh, such that, an ordeal? Well, you know that he never spoke about his days really? in the concentration camp, not because he was not able to speak about it like so many survivors, you mm -hmm. know? Always hoping if I don't talk about it, maybe there is a chance that it didn't happen. Uh, yeah. He had worked it through, you know. But when people asked him, tactless people asked him numerous times, was it really so bad? He said, had one stereotype answer. He said, no, it was a thousand times worse. Mm. So you never discussed it with him? No, we never discussed it. Mm. There was nothing to discuss. I know we it all know he was in, yeah. in, in solitary confinement, and that was a very clever thing of Hitler to do because that was the worst punishment uh, for that man who needed somebody with him and somebody he loved with him. He had a wife, it was a wonderful marriage, and, and seven children. And to put him, you know, he almost lost his mind. I can imagine. In in Sachsen, in Dachau, it was a little easier because he was allowed occasional visits, uh, visits with his uh, co uh, co uh, uh, prison inmates, uh, Catholic priests, and that was the time when he had he had seriously thought of converting to Catholicism, mm -hmm. and his. Catholic brothers were wonderful. He said, Martin, you would love to have you in our midst. But that decision has to be made when you're a free man. Mm -hmm. So he never did, of course. Now, you met him later in New York City. On the 20th of April, 1968, we met in New York. I had left Germany because my father had said, leave this country, let your children be born under a, another star. And I, you know, that never left me. So I went to the States and uh, I had one wonderful thing that put me ahead of, of uh, from other, other immigrants. I spoke English yeah. because we were a trilingual family, French, English, and, and German. From childhood you had been taught yes, English. Yes, I had, uh, we had a born mm. for French. We had my mother who was born in France and we had English nannies. Yeah. And that's why. So you went to America, you met Pastor Niemöller, and then you went back to Germany with him. Yeah, but I was married in the United States uh -huh. after one year. I was married to an NBC executive who left me after 10 years of 12, 10, 11 mm -hmm. years of marriage. My son grew up in Brooklyn and New York. I love New York like, you know, I'll never love another city like I love <laughs> New York. And but there I met Pastor Niemöller on the 20th of April, 1968. Hitler's birthday. Ah. And we saw each other and he took me in his arms when I went to his hotel and he said, you haven't changed one bit. Well, that was nice. So I fell in love with him. He fell in love with me. And I, uh, he, uh, he, he offered to come and live in the United States because he knew my dislike of Germany. And, uh, but I felt I couldn't, you know, yeah. his siblings were still alive, I couldn't do it. I understand. So I went to Wiesbaden, which was a very American town. I was a caseworker for the American Red Cross and the famous hostage hospital, the largest U.S. Air Force hospital outside of the United States, and lived happily after, ever after. And after he died, I wrote two books, and then my son went back to the United States he had been in college in the States and all that, in medical school in Germany. Yeah. And it didn't cost anything. He had a wonderful education. So you then came back, back to the States and yeah. you became very friendly with the humanist and the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel was opened, opened doors for me that I did not even know existed. Yeah. 
And for 40 years, I hadn't been able to speak about my father, not even to my son. He had died a violent death, you know, after the 20th of July, and uh, that was all. And on the 25th of April, 1946, I visited Ellie. Well, first of all, he had, had, had in, the, the first telegram I got uh, after Martin's death was from Ellie Wiesel, then president of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial yes, Council. Yes. And then in, in, he invited me to a conference, Righteous Gentiles, uh, Faith and Humankind in Washington. And then he uh, invited me to his home on the 25th of April. 1946, and he said to me, his wife was there too, Marion was in the room, and looking out on Central Park and the, all the blooming, you know, that the trees were already getting green, and he said, and now tell me about your father, what happened? And I said, Ellie, I can't tell you about it because I've never told anybody about that horrible story, and I can't tell you. And he said, the four words that would change my life of course you can. Mm. And I did, under streaming tears. And he said, and now you have to speak about it in public. Oh, as you, I said, I can't do it. Of course you can. You, I can't, you have to, to write books. And he said, I can never write books. Of course you can. And I and did. You did. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for telling us about your life, Sybil Niemeller. Thank Niemeyer. you for listening. And thank you for joining us today for the Drexel interview.